Hello everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am super excited to be doing another agent interview today with Tao Lei, a literary agent at Standard Dykstra Agency, where she has built an impressive list of kid lit through adult. Tao's books all walk the line of beautiful and commercial with lots of heart, and some of her clients include Rashi Chokshi, Sandhya Menon, Emily Skretsky, Janela Angelis, Julian Winters, Amelie Howard, Jessica Kim, and Emily Duncan. Many of her clients have shaped and are shaping what YA is today, and I am so thrilled to chat with you. Hi, welcome. Hi, Alexa. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Uh, so excited. I actually think you were one of the first agent interviews I ever did on my old blog. Wow, really? That was so the blog blog. Blog. I was like a baby agent then. And that's how we met, so to speak, meaning I just reached out to you, like, because... I had a lot of chutzpah, I guess, and I was like, oh, can I interview you? That's really important in this business. You gotta hustle. Right? And you've hustled hard. Um, I, I mean, legit, I feel like I've like watched you grow because you went from like new agent to like megastar. In <laughs> no, it's true. You're like, do you know how many people I talk to who are like, Tao is my dream agent? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good to hear. I still feel weird hearing that because I think, you know, a part of me is still like always learning and, you know, the industry is always changing for sure. Like I have a lot more experience now, but, um, you know, like the kind of the landscape of publishing is always changing. So I'm always trying to keep up like, you know, finger on the pulse of what's happening. Well, and speaking of, you have indeed come a long way and everyone always wants to know how does someone get into agenting? And I know you had a particularly interesting path or I find it interesting kind of how you ended up at Sander Dykstra and your agenting, literary agent career. Yeah, um, for me, my agenting path was really like serendipitous. Um, it was honestly, to me, like somewhat of a miraculous accident. Uh, for those who don't know, my background is actually in economics. Um, and I that's what I went to school for. I was planning to go to grad school, either um, business school or law school. That's what my parents expected from me. I knew nothing whatsoever about publishing. Um, I was looking looking for a position that would kind of combine my like you know the interests of my heart versus like the things I've been kind of like studying and preparing for and I kind of landed on the um, Dykstra's um, agency completely by accident really um, they had like an ad open for someone to assist with their sub rights and their financial person and it's like you know to baby towel it was like oh this is kind of economic slash accounting or contract somewhat related um, and I you know the, the interview I learned what like I did a bunch of research on like what is a literary agency. I had no idea what it was before. I met with um, Elise Capron, who uh, is very much like my you know even now mentor and everything um, at the agency, and just learned what publishing really is. And I was like, oh, people can actually work in publishing. People actually work in publishing. Um, so it was kind of like a weird way of getting into the job. Um, and for a very long time, I did not think I was going to be an agent at all. I was going to be, uh, my, my, I thought what my career path would be is um, a royalty manager or like, you know, something in subsidiary rights. Um, that's kind of what I kind of like entered the industry doing. Um, but like my boss and my colleagues were like really just so supportive. And at the time I was such an avid reader of young adult and children's um, literature. I was like a big fan of sci-fi fantasy. And so my boss was like, you know, no one at the agency is doing those genres and that type of market it's untapped here why don't you give it a shot and so I was like okay sure I guess um but I you know like again my love for like reading kind of like really shone through and like I found some projects that I really loved and I decided to say go okay let's do this let's give this a try and you know those authors decided to take a chance with me um we sold some you know made some book deals uh, and I was like oh my gosh this is like actually a 
something that could happen. Like, you know, it could be an actual career and job. And again, with like all the support from my agency, I started to take on more clients and really build my list. And what I really loved about Sandra Dykstra is just, you know, how much she championed, like in particular Asian American voices before it was, you know, Vogue or trendy, um, you know, from the very beginning, I always felt um, heard and, those type of stories I wanted to champion, she never really bat an eye about them, um, which is really great because, you know, as you know, I really pride myself in having a diverse list in kind of boosting marginalized voices, um, especially as a woman of color in publishing, like, you know, we're very rare still, um, although I, you know, fingers crossed the industry is changing and our numbers are climbing. Um, but it was just, you know, again, kind of like a miraculous accident of sorts. Another interesting thing for me is that you are now and have always been based in San Diego. So this all went down in sunny Southern California and not New York. Yeah. So I always get that question where, you know, people are curious, like, how's it like being an agent in the West Coast instead of in New York? And I have to say, from my experience, um, not much is affected. I think with technology today, you know, uh, we're seeing this now with the quarantine, um, you know, we've moved so far in terms of like being able to connect with one another virtually. Um, I do a lot of things on email. I do a lot of things through phone calls and now video chats. So uh, a lot of the logistics of my job hasn't been affected at all from where I live. Um, I think the only thing that's kind of like, you know, people might be like, oh, but you miss out on like the lunches with editors and things like that. And like lots of face to face time. That's true. But, you know, um, at least before the pandemic hit, there were a lot of conferences, a lot of events that I would attend and fly to. And that's where I got to get like lots of face time with people. And again, like with technology and I think um, you know, myself being an introvert and a lot of publishing people being introverts. Um, a lot of us are very used to having like online friendships and online relationships. Um, and that's kind of, you know, having worked out well for me here in San Diego without having to deal with New York life, which is fun as a visitor, but maybe not so much for me personally um, to live in, um, you know, with all the high living cost factors and everything like that. Well, we have high living cost factors in Southern California, but we also have the beach, so. That's true, that's true. I will have to say like, you know, speaking about that and like, you know, financial barriers for the industry, like I, I feel very privileged that, you know, I had a lot of family support um, financially in order to like make this kind of career work. I know that doesn't apply to everyone and continues to be a struggle, um, which is why it's like, you know, oftentimes if you can't make it to New York, it's really hard to get your foot through the door. Um, you know, luckily Sandy was based here in San Diego. San Diego actually has a huge like literary like community. So I was able to find my footing luckily in my hometown. Um, but I know it can be much more difficult if you're like somewhere else that's far flung from any, you know, literary circles. Well, related, uh, you stayed in the finance position at your agency for a while. Um, you didn't transition to full agent is what I mean until a few years ago. Yeah, so I actually did not transition to being a full agent until last year, like I think April last year. So it's been almost like one full year only now that I am like fully agenting and not doing any royalties um, or anything like that for my agency. And again, like, you know, talking about the, you know, financial, like, real, like, realistic look at our you know industry and this career um i think a part of me was always a little nervous uh about letting go um you know having that office portion uh of my uh job meant you know steady payroll you know um with being with agenting you work off of commission you work on spec a lot so it's a lot of fluctuating things so i think i was just you know, for a very long time, weary about like how far I can take that, you know, my passion career versus um, kind of like comparing it to a steady paycheck. So I would love to talk about the breadth of what you represent. You rep a ton of different categories and genres. So I'd love to talk about essentially what you look for in like middle grade and picture book, YA, adult, um, like manuscript wish list. 
Yeah, so I have a lot of manuscript wish lists. If you go on my Twitter, I have like a bazillion tweets about my wish list items. I think ultimately, though, I'm always looking for that, you know, that unique voice, um, something heartfelt. I think in the end, even if like, I, I mean, I love fast paced, tightly plotted stories. I love twists. Um, but in the end, if there's no heart or emotional like stakes to it, I think I can easily lose interest. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here for like character driven kind of like narratives. Um, I think the reason why I love a series is because I get so heavily and emotionally invested in the characters and seeing what happened to them. Um, so, so for me, it's always comes down to those characters, the voice, um, Otherwise, I'm pretty eclectic in terms of my tastes. Like, you know, I like bubbly, like rom-com stories. I like dark, gritty, like horrific, dark fantasy. Um, you know, I like space opera and like robots. So my taste is kind of like all over the place, but ultimately I have to really care about those characters. So speaking of genre, I've gotten a ton of questions about word count. So I was curious to hear your take on what is too much word count? Like what's too high on a YA fantasy versus an adult fantasy? And then YA sci-fi versus adult sci-fi? Like what's a red flag for you in the inbox basically? Yeah, so I just want to preface this that, you know, these word counts aren't supposed to sound arbitrary. There's like actually a lot of reasoning behind the word counts. Mostly it's because with debut books, you know, um, publishers have to think about at what price point are they going to sell these books at. Um, and that's different between the, you know, YA market and the adult market. You'll notice that if you go into a bookstore and you go into the YA section, a lot of YA hardcovers are usually under $20. Um, with adult books, a lot of hardcovers are up $20 or above. So that's just the way the market pricing has worked with those two different age groups. And so when you see, um, you know, agents or editors talking about word count for YA, we typically want a lower word count than we would if it was an adult fantasy. Um, with YA, we typically don't want to go over 100,000 words. The reason being is because the longer the book is, the more expensive it is to produce. And that means rising the price point above what consumers of YA are used to. Like, you know, if if you were to publish a YA book and have it be like 25 bucks, a lot of YA readers will balk at that and wouldn't want to buy it, mm -hmm. um, which makes it more difficult to sell. Um, Whereas like with a, the adult market, they're used to a higher price point. So usually a lot of fantasy and sci-fi in the adult realm can be over a hundred thousand words there often are they're usually like you know i feel like the average is like at least a hundred thousand to a yeah. hundred fifty even two hundred sometimes yeah. um because you know publishers are able to sell at that higher price point so uh in a way like you know it's not just about like yes i want like tightly plotted ya there's there tends to be um in ya a bit more um attention to how hooky and fast paced a story is um that's kind of like the vibe of ya whereas with fantasy you can uh, you know i feel like the adult fantasy readers are much more willing to have that slow burn to have that world building um whereas like ya needs that action needs that plot um not saying that adults readers don't want that too, but I think they have like, you know, the white audience is a little bit more impatient for something like that. And so they need something a bit more PC. Um, and so just because of those elements, um, that's kind of what has forced word counts to be the way they are to make sure that it makes sense both like pragmatically and, um, you know, um, stylistically for those, those markets. And so that essentially means that when the YA publishers do publish longer YA, which they do, they're taking a hit on the per book cost and they're counting on volume of sales, which would explain why established authors can often push that word count higher because they can offset it with economy of scale. Yes, definitely. Like if you go back and look at any like you know, series like the Harry Potter series, you'll notice that the very first few books are usually very 
much in the like shorter, more typical word count range of that genre or that market. And then as the books become more and more popular, later books in the series become like bigger and bigger tomes. Um, because at that point they know that, you know, if it's a Harry Potter book, it's going to sell. So it's okay if they, you know, take more of a hit in terms of production costs. Um, and it's okay to charge the book a little extra because they know the fans will still come to those books. You also mentioned earlier loving series and you've sold many series recently in a time when there's been a lot of, you know, conventional wisdom thrown around at querying writers not to pitch a series. So what's what are your thoughts on the saleability of, say, a trilogy in YA right now or also adult? That's a good question. I feel like, you know, it's kind of fluctuated throughout like publishing history. Um, for me, though, ultimately, I always judge a book, um, you know, for whatever, for what it is. Um, so when I get a query in, um, I usually don't care if it's the first book in a series or not, but I need to love that manuscript right in front of me then and there. Um, if the ending is a cliffhanger, that's fine. If the ending is like, you know, more standalone, that's fine too. But what dictates whether or not it will be successful as a series depends very much on that very first book and just how invested readers will be with those characters and that world. Um, so I, I personally have, you know, felt that I'm never going to say like, no, I'm just going to be close to series because they're not selling. Um, I, I'm always, you know, like, like I said, like, throughout publishing history that has fluctuated back and forth, like series are popular, series aren't popular, series are popular again. Um, it's always going to, like, it always will depend on that story. Um, so my advice in terms of like, should you write a series, should you not? I think ultimately you have to decide on just how well you can write that first book and whether that book can be a standalone or not. Um, that's kind of, up to the craft and execution of the writer. Um, but I wouldn't make decisions based on, you know, an agent or editor saying like, oh, series aren't selling or you know, standalones aren't selling. Um, I think anything can technically sell if it's done right. So another thing that I know about you is that you are a very editorial agent. So how do you approach working with your clients editorially. And generally, do you have any self-editing tips for writers before they query, like to get the manuscript where it would need to be for an agent like you to take it on? Yeah, so working with my clients, um, it'll vary depending on who I'm working with. I think each writer has a different style. And so as an agent, I tend to be try and be flexible to kind of accommodate those things. Um, my general or like go to default way of editing is usually notes on the pages themselves. Like, you know, I'll highlight things. I'll even do light line editing. I'll ask questions throughout the manuscript where I'm like, I need clarity here, or I'm confused by the sentence, things like that. Uh, or, you know, I feel like this character should show up sooner rather than later. And then when I actually send out my notes to my clients, um, I usually include like a brief kind of edit letter to kind of summarize my overall thoughts and like to address big picture uh, development that we might need to do um, for, you know, writers who are looking to query and who are looking to, you know, submit full or partials to agents and editors. Um, my suggestion is always to kind of like ask yourself big questions about the book. Like, you know, clearly like, you know, the top things I can think of immediately is like characters and their goals and stakes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to understand the characters' motivations and everything. I think ultimately I always go back to the characters and like digging deep into like what make them what makes them who they are. I also always like ask them to like um, think about like what would a reader who has no knowledge of this book ask? Um, and I think that's something that's very difficult to do, especially as a writer who's so deep into the world that they're writing about. Um, so this is where I think, you know, spending some time away from your manuscript before you're hitting send um, is always helpful. It kind of gives you that distance so you can kind of, you know, 
take yourself away from the story, forget a little bit of the details um, that you've been kind of like obsessively thinking about. And then by the time you go back into that manuscript, you're reading it with fresh eyes. And of course, having like beta readers, you know, critique partners are so important. I know a lot of established authors continue to have, you know, um, key second readers that help them work through their stories. Um, and, you know, I think that's always good to kind of like look at your story objectively um, so you can see how someone who has no knowledge whatsoever of your book or characters can come into your story and see it executed on the page and still come away with the feelings you wanted to um, invoke in them. Essentially their job in querying you is to make you care. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm here to fall in love with characters. I'm here to hate characters. Um, I love villains and I love to hate villains as much as I love to love them. Like there's always those villain boyfriends, but there's also those villains that you that are just scary and terrifying and you really want to see like, you know, them destroyed or overcome. Um, so, so yeah. Awesome. Well, speaking of queries, Everyone always wants to know, for you personally, do you have any auto rejects? Things that just like, you're like, bye, no. That's a good question. I try not to auto reject people as much as possible, um, especially because I think queer writing is a very specific skill that's different from actually writing, you know, a story. So I usually just scan most of my queer letters to get um, a gist of the premise um, and the concept of the story um, before I jump into the pages themselves. So I think the key things in a query letter is just to be not fancy, um, but to be concise and succinct about what you're trying to convey. Like, I want to know immediately what the hook is, who the characters are, you know, um, I think just having like very fundamental things like what genre and like age group a project is, is really important. Um, I think that's the only time when I kind of auto rejected a manuscript is when I've read it, the query, like, you know, I looked at the query letter and it's obviously a genre I don't even represent, or it's, you know, a project that obviously is not, like clearly is not a fit for me. Um, but otherwise I always give like even bad query letters a chance um, because again, like I think it's just such a different skill set. And even though someone might be bad at pitching a story, um, they might be amazing at telling it. Um, you know, I, I always feel like there's almost too much pressure in a query letter to like impress when I think for me, I just need basics. Like um, I just need to know that they can kind of quickly convey the premise um, and, you know, what kind of genre and book this is. And then hopefully that's enough for me to jump into, into the pages. Speaking of pages, so let's say you've jumped in, you like something, you request. What tends to lead to a no for you as you're reading? Just people always want to know, uh, how do I get an agent? So they, they always ask about the rejection side. <laughs> I just want to say it's actually really painful for me to say to reject a full or partial too, because usually there was something there reading, you know, the sample pages that made me want to request. And sometimes I this is this is probably why I sometimes take forever to get back on um, get back to your writer on their partial or their full manuscripts after I requested because I've been so on the fence about something. I think for me it's very much um, almost a gut feeling. I've had I've had a lot of projects which were well written um you know the premise was good but for whatever reason um i didn't have that must stay up all night reading and i think with being an agent is that we're gonna have to reread this story over and over and over and i have to feel that excitement every single time i read that manuscript again in order to advocate for it and champion it to editors who will also be reading it over and over who'll be sharing it with their teammates who will be you know reading about this like or hearing about this project over and over and still maintain the excitement and so if i can't maintain the excitement i don't think i can convey it to somebody else and i know that sounds really vague and subjective and it totally is um but that's kind of one of the reasons why i said no to a full um and again it's it's something that's just really difficult for me to maybe articulate i think a lot of agents feel this way though where it's like it's good it checks all the boxes of things i like but there's just not 
not that chemistry. And I really need that just natural spark to happen with me, the writer and the story. Um, and sometimes it's, it's not the writer itself, but maybe just that particular story. I've had, you know, various um, scenarios happen where I've actually rejected a story from a client that I later on took on with a different story. So, you know, and like revise and, you know, resubmits do happen where, you know, an initial version of the book didn't spark something for me, but it did still like, you know, again, checked all those boxes of the things I love. It was just maybe missing some crucial element or something that needed to be tweaked. And once the, you know, the writer was able to do that and send that back to me, I felt that connection and was able to, you know, we were able to match them. So the next thing I want to talk about is a little bit unusual, but I find it really cool. And that is that you have in the past and recently as well, literally scouted some of your clients. You found them in other places like Sanya Menon was self-publishing. And you also recently signed someone who was writing fan fiction and you're working with them on original fiction now. And I'm fascinated by this and I want to hear you talk about it. Yeah. So, you know, again, like I didn't come into publishing expecting to like, I had this career path. I was like studying to do this in school. Um, I came into it again, kind of because of my passion for books and my passion as a reader. So I think the reason why I you know, have reached out to those type of authors or writers is simply because I'm trying to find pleasure reading everywhere. Um, and I'm very much like, if you can tell from like my background, I'm kind of a big um, fangirl. Uh, I am into a lot of fandoms. I love TV shows. I love movies. Um, I am an avid fanfic reader way before I was in publishing. Um, and I continue to, you know, dip my toe into those kind of communities because those were the places that kind of sparked joy for me. Um, especially when, you know, you work in publishing, I think it's easy to get jaded about the you know, about writing and reading and, you know, manuscripts and editing and things like that. So it's always just kind of fun to kind of like find something that's, uh, you know, maybe undiscovered um, and just being like feeling that obsessive, addictive quality from it. Um, so for me, I don't actually actively go out scouting per se when I like go into, you know, AO3 or fanfiction.net. I don't go in there with an eyes like I'm an agent and I'm here to look for a writer to sign. I'm there as a fan uh, and I'm there looking for stories that will like again keep me up all night long. Um, and sometimes I will find um, a library of work from a writer who I feel have a lot of um, overlap with uh, traditionally published, you know, authors and writers. Um, and that's kind of when I kind of will reach out. Um, usually I can tell they're maybe interested in um, traditionally publishing, which is a very different animal than like, you know, fan fiction writing um, by like the comments, the author notes they've kind of made and like seeing their interactions in like, you know, their fandom community. Um, so again, like it's, it's me kind of cautiously reaching out to someone whose fanfic work I really enjoy, but who seems to have indicated uh, an interest and a willingness to kind of learn about publishing too. Um, and so that's when I kind of have found my successes. There's been definitely some fanfic writers who I really admire and think have done amazing work and they continue to write amazing fanfics to this day. But um, I could tell they were, not, they were not interested in like, you know, being an, a published author, which is again, like that's, you know, not necessarily like the career path they want and that's totally fine. Um, again, very different animals. Um, so for, for me, it's just kind of like, do I have that chemistry with like the writing and the writer? And also do I have kind of like a, a strategy in mind in how their writing could fit a traditionally you know, published um, marketplace. So just because I know that you have signed clients who previously self-published, do you have any advice for self-published authors when they are querying agents for traditional publishing in terms of how to address their self-published career and their queries, if at all? 
Yeah. So I think my biggest advice would be to not query something that's already self-published. Um, I'm more, I'm definitely open to people who have, you know, publishing sales history and everything like that. But what I'm looking for is something that is kind of will be fresh. Um, so rather than trying to, you know, revive a book that has been self-published maybe a year or two ago um, that you did kind of like, you know, maybe in a rush, maybe not, but maybe didn't have as great of a sales track as one would hope, um, I think you would get much better luck, um, you know, going to an agent with a new project. Um, I have nothing against self-publishing, to be quite frank. Um, I think it's the perfect avenue for like many writers. Um, I just have a hard time convincing um, you know, publishers to invest in a book that already has a sales history or may have already tried to tap into the market but wasn't able to break out. So it's much easier from an agent point of view um, to break out something new and something that no one has seen before uh, and build excitement over a blank slate rather than something that has, again, maybe has already found, you know, a handful of readers, um, you know, months or uh, years previously. Uh, so, you know, you mentioned me taking on Sanya Menon um, a few years ago. I can't believe it's been that long. <laughs> We've been working together. Um, during that time, too, self-publishing was such a different landscape. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the kind of new kid on the block in terms of, like, you know, a lot of writers were self-publishing. It was a brand new avenue for writing. Um, and it also exploded for uh, certain, you know, indie self-published authors. And I think traditionally, um, traditional publishers tried to uh, tap into that by trying to um, repackage some, you know, very popular self-published books. Um, I think though what we came out of that kind of time period is that a lot of publishers realized that once a book has self-published, it's kind of reached, um, you know, uh, an audience that it already could have. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of difficult to repackage a product that's already been out there as something like newer for like new people to take on. Like if you already like self-publish a book for 99 cents um, and it's reached like, you know, a hundred thousand readers, that's amazing that you reach a hundred thousand readers, but they were also only willing to read that for 99 cents. If a publisher took that project, same, same book and, you know, spent money to package it into like a whole new packaging, um, but want to sell it at even even like $9.99 or, you know, more realistically, if it's going to be hardcover, then like at least like $17.99. That's a price point that's very drastically different from that $0.99 cents or $1.99 or even $2.99 price point that your readership wanted wanted to consume the material at. Mm. Um, so they were, I think a lot of publishers found that, you know, it was just very difficult to break through and find new readers who would pay more for basically the same content. So this is why I usually tell people like, if you've already self-published, send something fresh and new um, to agents because then we can be like, this is a brand new book, brand new story, um, rather than trying to take something old and repackaging it as uh, something different, that's that's a lot more hurdles to overcome, I think. And so if someone is querying something brand new, but they have like a past catalog, in the query, do you wanna know things like sales on those past pieces or conversely, let's say there's a past book or two, but they didn't sell well at all. Should the author just leave that out of the query entirely? That's a good question. Um, I don't feel like they need to share their entire history in a career letter. I think a simple line just to state like, you know, I've previously self-published X, Y, Z and leave at that. And then, um, you know, as long as I know that the project I'm looking at doesn't have a history, um, that's totally fine. Um, I don't think it's something to like hide away or like be secretive about. I think it's always important to have open, honest communication with your agent so you can properly strategize together how to go about with a project. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, when you're creating, you're usually that's your first time like 
corresponding with an agent. I don't think you need to be like, here's all of like, you know, my entire, <laughs> my entire like sales history. Um, I would wait until like an agent has kind of like taken a bite of interest and, you know, maybe on the call has, you know, as an agent, I would always ask at that point, and then that's when they can be more forthcoming with more information or details, but I, I would not recommend to do it in a query letter. Again, I wouldn't hide it in a query letter. I would just like keep it short and sweet. Um, just like I said, a single line just to like say you've been, you've self-published in the past and then um, I'll make a note of that and if I'm interested in the current manuscript and want to learn more about your history, I'll ask about it once, um, once we get a call going. Awesome. Um, so another much asked question from a bunch of different people, uh, I get to have a lot of international viewers and they always want to know how being from another country, living in another country, not being US based impacts you in querying, if at all. It doesn't impact me um, at all, I don't think. Uh, I think the only thing that might be a hurdle for me is if um, English is not their first language and they're struggling with writing the story in English, just because I work with um, American US publishers primarily and they need the work in the manuscripts to be written in English. Um, but otherwise I work with people all over the world. I have clients in the UK, I have clients in Asia. Um, the only thing that would kind of like complicate that is really like maybe like like tax paperwork um, and that's something like again like our agency will walk you through um, but otherwise as long as the writing is good and I love it I don't see a reason to not take on someone just because they're in Australia or something I mean if I'm able to do my job in San Diego I imagine writers can <laughs> do their job in like you know in Russia and Germany and Asia so yeah yeah. Well, and like you never have to like meet your agent or your publishing team in person. Um, I've never met either personally. <laughs> and I'm based here. So. Yeah. So, you know, like when we were talking about how long it took me to become a full agent, um, I actually did not go into New York until last year. And so a lot of the editors I finally met in person, I've been working with them for like five years or more. Um, and again, like technology is amazing. We can do so much through emails, so, so much through phone calls and um, things like that, that I think um, the possibility of like writing remotely and not being in New York um, is very real and um, just possible. And to close, I would love to ask you another viewer submitted question that I really loved, which is what are a lot of editors asking for right now? That's a great question. And, you know, I think considering our current um, time period and, you know, just the state of the world, I think a lot of people, myself included and editors included, are looking for escapist stories. Um, I'm not looking for like quarantine or pandemic stories. I can say that for sure. Um, I've gotten a lot of, um, editors reaching out and telling me they're excited for, you know, lighthearted rom com -y stories. Um, I think that's been true for a little while now, um, and it continues to stay true. Um, a lot of the, I guess, trends in what agents and editors like, I think can sometimes be reflected from what you see us tweeting about um, we're consuming in terms of media. So like a lot of TV shows um, that are hot, sometimes that will get reflected in an agent or editor's taste. Um, I think um, the boom in um, graphic novels lately have been really exciting as like a manga reader. Um, I'm very excited to see kind of like Western traditional public really like sink their teeth into that and I see a lot of my colleagues who have similar you know love for like sequential arts um, and storytelling through comics um, been really excited about that so I've been developing a lot of graphic novels and I've been asked for a lot of graphic novel proposals recently from editors so that is it Tao thank you so much uh, let people know where they can find you on social media and how they can query you so I am on both Twitter and Instagram though you'll probably see me on Twitter the most. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Tao Lei 8. Uh, on Instagram, I'm at Agent Tao. 
Uh, you can also query me, though I'm close to submissions currently of this filming. <laughs> um, but usually, I I use, yeah, but usually I use um, Query Manager. So there's a query me link on uh, both my Twitter profile page and as well as my agency's official website. And um, usually I will update it to show exactly what I'm looking to see in order to uh, submit to me. And if I'm close, there will be a kind of nice little note that says, sorry, Tao's temporary closed. Please come back at another time. Uh, and I often post my query statuses on Twitter. And when do you anticipate reopening to queries, maybe? So fingers crossed that I catch up on everything, um, but I am anticipating to reopen in June or July, um, depending on just my workload. And again, like I read every single query myself, uh, so it just takes a little bit of time for me to catch up um, and you know, considering my, my client workload as well, but hopefully June or July. So thank you so much. This was fantastic. Everyone give this video a thumbs up if you like it and I will do more literary agent interviews. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. And as always, everyone, thank you for watching and happy writing.